Welcome to the Teaching Value in Healthcare Learning Network. Come join us to hear leaders in the field share practical and tangible advice about how to develop engaging curriculum and health system innovation to train a new generation of healthcare providers from diverse specialties and professions skilled to deliver high value care. With national concerns about rising healthcare costs, as well as overuse, underuse, and misuse of medical care, Costs of Care and the ABIM Foundation created the Learning Network as a space to share ideas, educational materials, strategies, and an open forum. Our goal is to discuss ways to get started, implement, and sustain feasible innovations in teaching value at your institutions. I'm September Wallingford, the Director of Operations for Costs of Care, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We're excited to be featuring Jordan Harmon, who's not only our advocacy director at Costs of Care, but also the managing director of the HSS, Center for the Advancement of Value in Musculoskeletal Health at the Hospital for Special Surgery in New York City. As the managing director, he focuses on helping clinical teams deliver high value care. Jordan, welcome, and thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me, excited to be here. Great. So um, I think it'd be great to start out today by telling us a little bit more about the Hospital for Special Surgery and how your hospital has developed and supported the infrastructure to create your new center for the advancement of value. Yep, perfect. Um, and, and would love to do so. So a little bit about HSS, and I think it's important that, that folks understand that before we talk about the center. So HSS is, um, is very unique in that we're a center that focuses entirely on musculoskeletal care. So we have a very specific focus. Um, we see you know, roughly 32,000 patients a year um, as surgical patients, and we take care of roughly 150,000 patients um, annually um, in, different, in different ways. Um, we have orthopedics um, and rheumatology, and one of the great things about HSS is that um, we've really focused on being the musculoskeletal health leader, um, not only in the country, but, but across the world. Um, and what that means is really helping educate, um, you know, the broader population and, and other facilities on appropriate ways to take care of patients with, with uh, musculoskeletal health issues. Um, you know, speaking to the depth and the knowledge of, of HSS value, um, we've taken care of patients in, in musculoskeletal health, orthopedics, and rheumatology for, for you know, um, a very long time. And so we've amassed this um, great amount of knowledge on clinical pathways and protocols and um, specific ways to engage patients differently than other places. We focus so much on it that we've actually developed it as part of our strategic roadmap um, in, in the future and have developed a new center um, that's focusing specifically around value. So anybody that's listening to this today, you know, I would think, you know, the first step in, in creating value at institutions is setting up the infrastructure to do so because many health systems have been thinking about these problems um, very historically and they've piecemealed solutions together. So this, the point of the center, the new center, is really to bring together, um, you know, teams, uh, clinical teams, interdisciplinary teams that um, involve nurses, um, surgeons, other types of physicians like physiatrists um, together so that we identify specifically ways that we can engage patients uh, in, in value and provide better value to, uh, to patients. Um, so the center, you know, so just to comment on the center a little bit more, um, we focus on, you know, really taking um, evidence-based clinical protocols and putting them into practice. Um, that's one of the specific focuses we work and engage with external partners such as employers um, and other institutions to really drive value. And I'll get back to that in a second. And then the third thing is really, you know, take what we know um, and really develop that into a solution that we can, you know, share with a broader population. We've actually developed, um, you know, through other, through other avenues in the institution, a global health perspective on this. And we are out educating other institutions um, in, in other countries around better ways to take care of patients. Specifically, um, just to provide a, a quick example, you know, back pain is one of the largest uh, problems across the country. It's, you know, roughly 15% of, of an employer's um, claim costs. And so it's very large and it's continuing to grow. 
And so if you just look at back pain, um, you know, there's many cases where patients are having unnecessary surgeries. Um, they're being um, put in imaging when they're not necessarily um, a, a candidate for that MRI. Um, and so the, the, the center really focuses on providing the right appropriate value, uh, the pr appropriateness of care for those patients, educating clinicians um, across the institution here, but also other areas like primary care networks um, that can really help filter appropriate patients um, to, to imaging and surgical um, offices when they, when they need to be. So I'll, I'll stop there for a second. Yeah, so that infrastructure sounds incredibly robust and I really um, like the piece about value being part of the institution's strategic roadmap. Uh, can you share an example of an initiative that sort of highlights this infrastructure that has been created? Definitely. So, you know, there's a lot of initiatives that are happening across the institution um, and that are part of the center. Um, one of the things that we've really focused, I'll, I'll actually comment on two. One is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, identifying those, those wasteful areas that we can really focus on and remove from the system in back pain. Um, so specifically looking at care pathways um, that, that have been developed um, and extending those preoperatively so that we identify um, the patients that need to go to MRIs, um, the patient that needs to go to a physiatrist or a physical therapist at the right time. Um, and those are also being um, utilized for things like chronic conditions that patients suffer, suffer from longer term. So, you know, a diabetic patient who has um, knee pain or back pain um, can be, uh, those things need to be addressed at the same time that we're addressing the, the musculoskeletal health issue to really ensure the success of the patient long term. Um, so that's one thing. The more tangible, um, you know, example that I'll comment on and talk, talk through is, um, you know, a number of years ago, we actually started um, down the pathway of creating clinical uh, pathways that have time-based um, outcomes. Uh, for each of our procedures. And so if you come here as a patient for a hip procedure or a knee procedure or a spine procedure, um, we have outlined um, specific things that need to happen in the recovery period. Um, and so there was a team that got together, an interdisciplinary team that was involved, um, you know, full of nurses, physicians, um, you know, payer, payer folks as well that really helped develop these pathways um, and bring the team together. So those pathways were laid out. Um, they were put into our new EMR system that we went live with a number of years ago. And our clinicians, our nurses specifically, are now documenting against those outcomes. So as an example, um, you know, postoperatively, if a patient should be receiving um, some type of, uh, you know, dietary, uh, you know, uh, recommendation like clear liquids within a certain number of hours, um, we would want to know if the patient actually met that criteria. If they weren't able to, to take those, those liquids in, in the time that we expected them to, our nurses are now documenting against those variances and saying, or against those outcomes and saying the reason why the patient may not have been able to do that, such as, you know, they're vomiting, they're nauseous, et cetera. And so it's giving us a lot of good data on why patients aren't progressing at the speed and the rate that we'd want them to. Um, which is leading to further value change um, by increasing the, um, the focus on the pathways, re-examining whether clinical protocols here are correct or not, um, and whether we want to change those um, down the line. So that's one really tangible example, um, you know, that we put into place. Um, in, in partnership with that, we actually drove a lot of efficiencies through the communication changes that we made. Um, and that, what, what that really means is um, you know, handoff is a difficult thing at any hospital between clinicians that are that are coming on and, and some are th that are leaving. And so we really made it a focus to ensure that the right clinical information was being handed off on the pathways and that would be addressed on our morning rounds. So we had a, a very specific um, task. We outlined um, the things that should be transferred. We actually developed a new way to do that in our system so that it can be um, hardwired into, into the process. Um, and so now clinicians are handing off both in person, verbally, but also in the system so that it's documented and there can be um, a, a place for them to look back and see and make sure they've got the right information. 
Um, and that really focused on, you know, improving our pathways, improving our interdisciplinary uh, care across the hospital. Um, and um, as a result of that, which I'll talk through in a second, are, are some amazing results. Yeah, that's, um, you know, when you talk about the interprofessional team and hardwiring certain pieces of documentation into, you know, the system so that you can get this rich data to feed back into your pathways. Um, you know, cost of care, we've discussed a lot about how important the interprofessional team is um, and the impact that they can have on creating and maintaining value. So talked a little bit, but just wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on how do you develop the workflows to be inclusive um, and support these interprofessional teams? Yep, that's a great question. So, you know, any, any administrator or folk, uh, people who are not clinical um, and partnering with clinicians as part of the interprofessional team, I think, you know, we must realize and have a full appreciation for um, the daily care that goes on, the processes that people go through that may be wasteful, that, um, you know, don't add value, and those that do. And so I think it's really important that people fully appreciate those and, and get immersed in, into, the, into the environment. One of the things, and, um, you know, it, it's actually available on our website, you know, cost of care that I use even, you know, think about it daily is the cost framework, um, which is a great way to think about getting, you know, the right involvement um, and the different ways that you need to do that. So here at HSS, there's no possible way to do that without changing the culture of the organization. You know, we had a top, a top down and a bottom up approach. So a lot of our staff were heavily engaged in process improvement projects and, you know, brought things to us. Um, but at the same time, we had a commitment from leadership that said, you no, know, we actually do want to bring on chief value medical officer um, to help lead this on the clinical side. We do want to create this new center. Um, and so it was a big part of the success that we've had. The other part of that is system change in the cost framework. Um, and I think, you know, building things into the workflow is super important because if you, you know, anybody's, everybody's busy throughout the day. They continue to, to take care of more patients and be stressed in different ways across healthcare institutions. Um, and I think it's super important that we build those into systems so that people are not able to forget um, and we actually have them hardwired so um, they're documented. That's really important. And, um, you know, one of the things that we're focusing on now um, as part of that framework is really the training and education that comes along with the culture change and the, and the system change that you have in the system. Um, you know, you really have to make sure that people are educated and buy into those things. So the, the, the interpro interprofessional team, uh, getting back to your question, is super important in making sure that, um, you know, everybody's buying in, everybody's educating everybody else. Um, and it's a trickle down effect because um, once somebody gets really excited about the changes and they see the improvements um, and they see that it's hardwired into the system, uh, it, it continues to grow and continues to improve care across the institution in ways that, you know, I couldn't possibly have imagined or, you know, think of just, you know, sitting in my office. So it's really important. Yeah, and, you know, your previous position at HSS as the Director of Operational Excellence, I know you worked really closely with those um, who are working on the front lines. And so when you talk about systems change, you know, not changing the system from an administrative level, but actually going down to those who are providing to the care, to those who are actually working in the system and, you know, getting their feedback into what changes are going to work for them. Yeah. Yeah, I would say like that's probably one of the most important things. And I think one of the things that many people forget. So, um, you know, building the knowledge around, um, you know, many people that may be listening to this may be ingrained into processes and are thinking, of course, I know what the, you know, how to change this because I do it every day. Uh, but remember that people um, in leadership positions across your institution may or may not have that same exposure. Um, and really understand the process or the, or the problems that, that are happening on the ground. And so it's really important that people sort of also manage upward. And so, um, you know, we had many times clinicians bring to me different problems uh, and say, hey, come down and actually watch this. Come down and actually spend a day with me and see this um, in, in real time. And so I, I did that. Um, and those were ways that we worked and collaborated together to figure out 
you know, better solutions to some of the problems because you many times can't imagine uh, or think there might be the right solution. Uh, but when you actually go watch it, uh, when you actually go spend time with people, um, it, the, the solution that you come up with is actually incredibly different. So I would, you know, underscore the fact that that's super important um, and, and people really need to think through that. Yeah. Um, so you're going to be sharing some uh, slides with us, which is great. Um, and on one of your slides, you have a slide talking about capabilities and having to do with this shared leadership, and new ideas and new alignments. And I wondered if you could talk about the new alignments piece a little bit. Yeah, um, definitely. So the capa you know, capabilities is really important. Um, and I think making sure that the organization is aligned, you know, come, it comes back to, part of it comes back to the culture and making sure that you have um, the right people in place to, to sort of structure this um, and that you're aligned with both the um, goals of the organization, um, goals of the clinician, and goals of, you know, frankly, mental management, because I think all are, you know, sort of almost competing uh, objectives many times at, at different institutions, and they, they can't be. They really need to align. And so um, the alignment of the organization for value and the appetite for value is very important. Um, so if there are things that people, um, you know, it doesn't have to be huge. So if there are projects, if there are things that need to be addressed um, that people see on a, a, an everyday basis, they should be raising those um, to, their, to their managers and leaders to, to provide those as examples. On the flip side, if there are people um, that are listening to this that are in those leadership positions, they need to have the appetite to be more aligned with the clinical team um, to really understand some of those problems, uh, to continue to see them and, and pursue them. Um, I, so I hope that addresses the question. Um, I think alignment is very important. Um, and it was something we focused on here. And I don't know if you ever get there um, completely because of the way that inter, you know, the interprofessional team is really trained. I think you know, nurses are trained um, in a very different way than physicians and, and administrators are thinking about, you know, different things than, than both of those. And so I think the alignment of the team is, is very important, but very difficult and something that's really hard to achieve. Yeah. Um, on your slides, you're also sharing some of your value metrics and outcomes and wondering if you could speak a little bit to those also. Yep. So let me talk about let me talk about the results and, and some of the projects that we've done, uh, you know, and how it's impacted care and value here at HSS. So, you know, value is sort of elusive. Um, it's a term that we throw around quite frequently, um, and no one really knows exactly what it means. Um, to me, it's always been, you know, th there are really two components that many people talk about: quality and price or, or cost. And um, the real the big third piece of this is um, patient uh, engagement or patient experience. And I think that's really understated in the value equation. Um, so we think about those three things at HSS. And so as you look at, you know, if you're listening to us on a, on a podcast, you won't see this, but um, some of the results that, that we've seen here at HSS, um, you know, show incredible success for some of the pathways. So when we implemented the pathways and we aligned um, our clinicians and our administration and put those into the system, uh, we've seen dramatic increases in adherence for our knee and hip pathways. So what that means is that, you know, we're identifying, you know, reasons why patients wouldn't be adhering to particular, um, you know, processes. Um, and then we're, we're figuring out projects to, to address those. Uh, but for those patients that um, are on the pathway, there are more patients that are adhering to those clinical outcomes than ever before which is a good thing. Um, and, and again, the data that's, uh, that we're getting now is also showing reasons why those patients wouldn't be adhering to those, path, to those pathways. So, you know, we've continued to see pathway adherence go up um, for multiple reasons, um, including our, our daily rounds expansion, which we, we did to move those to weekends. So we now have a very structured weekend rounds in place which wasn't occurring before, um, just continue to provide that education or uh, communication uh, amongst the team and uses the system to document those pathways. Um, and then I'll, you know, I'll just talk, you know, a minute about the organizational um, and value metrics, uh, because I think all of this is really, you know, leading up to um, broader quality metrics that really get displayed 
um, externally. So a lot of people don't see the pathway adherence when we talk about you know HSS value because we it's not something we talk frequently about externally, but it's continuing to improve our, our metrics around complications, infections, um, discharges to home, and readmissions. So uh, you know there's a slide in here which which I'll allude to right now around the the patients that we're seeing and the, the outcomes that they have. So, you know, we have some of the, the lowest complication rates in the industry um, in, in infection rates. Um, we've discharged more of our patients to home, which right now for musculoskeletal health patients, um, uh, actually hip and knee patients is really important because um, some of the clinical uh, evidence now shows that going to home is actually the best solution for many patients um, in, in the recovery. And you know fewer readmissions, so many of those patients are not getting readmitted back to the hospital. Um, they're having successful outcomes with the appropriate discharge to home. And so all of those things, in my mind, equal value because many of those patients are not, uh, you know, having recurrences, having problems where they need to come in and get a revision done or have a readmission in another hospital. They're getting it done the first time correctly, and that's really important. The other thing I'll comment on, something we focus more on, and, and really is a future, uh, you know, focus for us, is the right diagnosis and treatment at the right time. So the the very uh, at the very outset, um, you need to make sure that the the person who sees you is identifying the right type of treatment for you. So you know, take spine cases for example. We have a very detailed process on how those patients are triaged. Um, many patients across the country who enter into an office end up in unnecessary spine surgeries, which is, you know, wasteful and costing the system a, a lot. Um, we identified here that about 30, 26%, 30% of patients who come in with a previous surgical recommendation um, at other institutions elsewhere receive a non-surgical recommendation here, meaning you know, there, there's many reasons why those patients um, wouldn't need to have surgery yet. Um, or are not appropriate for surgery, we shouldn't be doing surgery on those patients, yet they've been identified as a surgical patient elsewhere. So it just kind of it kind of alludes to this opportunity and value, um, the next frontier around making sure that, um, you know, pro appropriate cases are being done, um, that there's ways to triage appropriately, um, the access is there for patients so that they don't feel like they're waiting, uh, you know, too long uh, to get to get to the right person and end up in the wrong place um, anyways. So those things are, are things that we're really focusing on um, in the future and will be exciting to see what we and other institutions across the country come up with. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like your outcomes really speak to the success of the infrastructure at HSS. And, you know, when you think about um, these new ideas for value and then actually being able to see those in the outcomes, there's this ideal um, idea of scaling. And I think that's where a lot of people um, run into some challenges and you've talked a little bit about the importance of the interprofessional team, the importance of alignment between the frontline clinicians and administration and just wondering are there any other factors you see that um, get you to that impactful scale? Yeah that's a good question as well. I think you know one of the things that we forget um, especially in healthcare is that people operate very much in silos currently uh, and that they don't see the direct tie um, to how things are being impacted, both in the institution, externally, um, and, and the broader market. So, for example, the, the folks that were working with us on the, the pathway improvement project um, and building that into a specific path, um, you know, tool that they were using every day, it's important that they see how that's impacting quality and value at HSS. Um, so we're trying to really develop through the center a feedback loop, um, both directions actually, uh, for people that are involved in projects, that are leading projects, um, and really driving some of the value that's being, you know, promoted externally. So these, I get to, I get to, you know, talk about these great metrics on a regular basis. Many people internally that, you know, our nurses, our PAs um, that are really driving this don't necessarily see that every day and don't see the connection. Um, so we need to make sure that there's a, a direct tie and link back to this. The other thing I would say is that, you know, right now the focus is value most, well, part of the reason is because 
uh, of changing methodologies and payment structures. And I would say the third component of this really ne needs to be payer um, folks. So our payer strategy team here has been deeply involved in you know, thinking through solutions that make sense for, um, for how we get paid both now and in the future. Um, you know, that really can't be left out of it. Uh, we're, we are a nonprofit institution, but at the same time, you know, we need to ensure that we're, we're getting paid for the work that we do. And so thinking about the right ways that align both the clinical value piece um, uh, that, that we do, um, the clinicians who actually provide the care to patients here, um, and then the payers who we work with very, very often to try to figure out the right methodologies and, and how to get this stuff paid for. Um, those three pieces need to be connected, need to be providing feedback to each other. And so that's why this center is such a very important piece of success um, for us, because it brings together all of those people in the same room and has them focusing on, on specific goals together uh, in order to create alignment. Um, so this has been incredibly interesting um and before we go i just wondered if there's anything that you wanted to touch upon or share that we didn't get to um no i would you know the only thing i would i would mention before we sort of end is that you know i'd be happy to talk about this number one with anybody who's interested further um, because i think there's a very it's very important that you know there is a strong connection between the infrastructure that's set up in the institution, the administrators, and the clinicians, and, and that really means the interprofessional team, so nurses and uh, PAs and physicians who are all, tr you know, trying to work together on this stuff. Um, I, I can't say it enough that it's, it's really important that you have the infrastructure for those teams to work together, um, and I think that no matter what role you play in your institution, whether it's a current, um, you, you know, whether you're a current trainee, uh, whether you're an administrator, whether you're um, somebody who's in med school, all of these things are going to become increasingly important um, in, the, in health, the broader healthcare landscape over the coming years. And so, um, you know, bring those things up, make sure that there's alignment and there's uh, structure within the institution. Um, there's small ways that people can do that, even if you're not in a leadership position to, to do that. I think it's very important. Great. Well, thank you again for joining us, Jordan, and for everybody watching and everybody listening. Thank you for joining today, and we hope that you join next month's um, webinar and podcast.